your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, on this Mother's Day to Proverbs 1. When you think of uh, Mother's Day and Proverbs, your mind probably goes to Proverbs 31. Very good. We're not going to be in Proverbs 31 today. Uh, we're going to be in some other passages in Proverbs. Last week, we started a series of messages in Proverbs entitled, Daily Wisdom from Our Wonderful Counselor. How should you and I live? What is, how has God called us to live as his people in this world forever how long he gives us? Last week, we saw wisdom's prerequisite, and we're going to kind of refresh our minds about that here in a moment, what we looked at from verse 7 of Proverbs 1. But today, we're going to see a mother's wisdom, a mother's wisdom from Proverbs. And so turn with me, if you would, to Proverbs 1. We're going to read 7, 8, and 9. Proverbs 1, verses 7, 8, and 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. For they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Be seated if you would. Keep your Bible open. We're going to flip to a few different passages in Proverbs and other places as we work through uh, these verses here together today. When you think about what Proverbs calls us to, and on this special Mother's Day is God's calling you and God's calling me, moms and dads, spiritual moms and dads. He's calling us to a certain life. He, is giving us, he has given us a responsibility, a stewardship for those over whom we have influence, those that are watching us, those that are listening to us, those that are in a lot of ways following in our steps. And as we think about Proverbs, this morning, we cannot say everything that could be said about mothers and about wisdom and about parenting. We cannot say everything because it is, uh, Proverbs are full of instruction and guidance uh, for how we ought to live our lives and for how we ought to pass that wisdom, godly wisdom, on to others. But in these, these verses that we've read this morning, I do see a pattern here, and I just want to throw out some reminders from you as we try to explain what we've read this morning in Proverbs 1, Proverbs 6, and then what Colson read for us in Proverbs 23. The first truth is this. Before we even get to a mother's role and a mother's influence and how to guide children, how to guide others that would look at you, the, the, the first reality that we've got to really nail home is this. To give wisdom, we must first be growing in wisdom. In order to give wisdom, we must first be growing in wisdom. And that's where we revisit what we unpacked last week, which is Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. If you were here last Sunday, we saw that everything that follows in Proverbs is based off of this verse, this truth. That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You can't go any further without it. If you are trying to do this thing on your own, you're going to fail. You're not going to succeed. Because eventually, you're, as you lean on your own understanding, it's not strong enough to hold you up. It's not strong enough to hold up uh, underneath all of the pressures and demands that this world has for us. And so we see that the key to living in wisdom, the key to godly parenting, the key to being a godly dad, a godly mom, starts and is found in verse 7. It is the fear of the Lord because in order to give wisdom, we must be growing in wisdom. Now just quickly, briefly, to remind us of what the fear of the Lord means, because I know that we have folks that were not here last week who are here today. We've got some guests with us, and we're really glad that you are here. And so just a, a quick overview of last week, we saw that the fear of the Lord is a little bit different than what many uh, understand to be the fear of the Lord. On the one hand, the fear of the Lord for many means that I am scared to death of the consequences that come when I step outside of his boundaries, that I am fearful of God's judgment and wrath. And so, uh, you know, I'm constantly thinking God's out to get me. Now, now, let's be sure you and I always ought to have that kind of understanding that God is powerful, that God is just, that God is holy, and that there are consequences for sin. But as we grow in our relationship with him, we don't base our choices, 
We, we don't base the pattern of our lives. We don't base our motivations simply off of that dread of consequences. Well, I can't do this because God's going to get mad at me, and then I won't have his blessing and favor, so I, I need to stay in line. That's still there, but over time, as I begin to know the Lord, and as the Lord reminds me of his grace and his goodness and his love, his provision that he's continued to pour out in my life, his desire for me to be in relationship with him, the more we begin to understand that the fear of the Lord is not just the dread of consequences, it becomes a healthy reverence and awe for who he is. It becomes this, this, this desire that I don't wanna step outside of God's boundaries, that I wanna live a life that's honoring to him because I want to see the smile of God. I don't wanna break my heavenly father's heart you remember we used the illustration last week of even our own kids, that we don't want them to, 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 to make choices and to live in a certain way simply because they're fearful that when they get home, we're going to scream and yell at them. That has to be part of the discipline process of not sparing the rod, but hopefully they get to a place where they're not wanting to break mama's hearts. They're not wanting to disappoint dad because they have that healthy relationship with us. This is the, the, the idea here, that you and I are growing in our knowledge of Christ so that we see that his heart is pure and his heart is, uh, he's a God of love, that he's a God who wants relationship with us. And to think of disappointing and receiving God's disapproval doesn't lead me to act because I just fear the consequences but because I truly love him, that's a heart that's growing in wisdom. That's a heart that's growing in true knowledge. That's a heart that's growing to know the heart of God. And so what we see is that in order to give godly wisdom, in order to parent our kids, in order to live our lives in a manner worthy of the calling to which Jesus has called us, we have to have a reverent awe, and we ought to stand regularly in awe of who he is. Mamas, I could say this to dads. I could say this to many others. This is true for all of us. This reminder that I have echoed already, only a mother who is growing in wisdom can give wisdom. Only a mother that's growing in godly wisdom can give godly wisdom. If you were to take Proverbs 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, this foundation, and you were to fast forward a little bit into the New Testament and to, to, to listen to the voice of Jesus, how he would phrase this fear, this reverent awe of the Lord, this all-consuming uh, desire to please him, how he would phrase it is this. He would say, take up your cross daily and follow me. There's this idea of crucifying self, this idea of crucifying my wants and my desires, crucifying the way I think things ought to be done in order to follow Jesus. Now, that's not something that we talk a whole lot about today because we hear from our world quite often and with regularity, we hear from our world, you know, that, that you do you. you, you be you, you follow your hopes and dreams. Well, folks, that's anti-Bible because the Bible says don't follow your hopes and dreams. Don't follow your hearts. Crucify yourself. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. The Apostle Paul would word it this way. If we were to fast forward a little bit more into the New Testament, he would say, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives within me. And so in order to give wisdom, we must constantly live in a state where we can say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It's not about my wants. It's not about my wishes. It's not about my plans. It's not about my purposes. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Jesus who's living within me. If we're to give godly wisdom, we must be growing in godly wisdom and that starts with fearing the Lord. Now, in the passage that Colson read for us this morning, and he did a wonderful job reading for us in Proverbs 23, I want you to turn there with me just briefly, if you would. Proverbs 23, verse 26. 
And I told you, we're going to be flipping a little bit more than we normally do on a Sunday morning. Because I want you to see these various angles. It's almost like a diamond that you're twisting. And as the light refracts and reflects off of it, it becomes more and more beautiful. We're doing that with Proverbs. Now, what does it mean as we're growing in wisdom to give wisdom? How do we share this? On the one hand, we know it's through our words. We know it's through instruction and teaching. That's in Proverbs 1.8 and in other places. We know that we have to open our mouths and speak truth, sometimes that are hard truths, to our kids. But there's another dynamic at work here. Look at verse 26 of Proverbs 23. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Another rendering would be, let your eyes delight in my ways. And so godly mothering, godly parenting, means that first of all, that I am daily pursuing Jesus. That I am making time for Jesus to speak into my life. That I'm making time for Jesus to speak some hard truths into my life. That I'm making time for Jesus to encourage me and to comfort me and to shape me and to mold me, to do divine surgery on me when I need it. Dads, the same is true for us, that in order to be a godly dad, in order to grow in wisdom, we've got to make ourselves available before the Lord and his word daily for those things to occur. And as we begin to live this out, what we see is that there is the spoken word, but there's also the daily walk that we are exemplifying for our children and for those who are looking at us. Do you see that in verse 26? He says, let your eyes observe. What happens in a family? What happens to kids when mama and daddy are telling them one thing but doing something else and they are constantly saying, do as I say and not as I? What happens to that child? He's torn. She doesn't know what to make of it because on the one hand, she's being told this, and on the other, she is seeing this. And the two things are very much opposed to one another. On the one hand, the child is hearing, be respectful of your elders. Say please and thank you. And on the other hand, what they're seeing from mom and dad is a life of harsh speech and a life of complaining and bitterness. And so the two don't add up. And what we see in Proverbs is that the one who's growing in wisdom is having his or her heart shaped in such a way so that what we're saying lines up with how we're living. So that when the kids are looking at us and listening to us, what they're hearing are lined up together. This is true for those that live in our homes, but it's also true for those who we are spiritual moms and dads to in our communities whether in the school, whether on a ball field, whether in this church building where so many of you serve in a variety of ways and you have people looking at you. Unless you think that it's all just people who are physically younger than you, who are at a certain age, there are probably folks in this very room that you may never know about who are looking at you seeking an example to follow. They are looking at you. They're looking at me. They're listening to us, but they're watching all at the same time of how we live our lives. Sometimes that means that when we're telling our kids that you ought to say, I'm sorry when you've done something wrong. Sometimes that means going to somebody and looking them in the eye and saying, I'm sorry. When our words and our daily walk do not line up, It's a problem. The person who's growing in wisdom sees that those two things come together so that we can say, do as I say and as I do. Our children should delight in our ways as we delight in the ways of our heavenly father. Do Do you see the flow here? It's almost like a river. The river is flowing into the mom and the dad from the Lord. And then that river doesn't get stopped up and dammed up. What does that river do? That river keeps flowing through us into others. It's almost as if 
what I have shared with you from time to time about what I heard from someone that I look up to concerning his, his spouse. And he said he prays often, Lord, love her through me. It's a prayer that I often pray. Lord, love Lindsay through me. It's a prayer that you often pray. But not only to our spouses, to those that would look at us. Lord, love my kids through me. Teach my kids wisdom as you're teaching me wisdom and what it is to walk in your ways. To give wisdom, we must first be growing in wisdom. Now back to Proverbs 1 for a moment. When we get to verse 8, we see that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and that leads right into what he says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Forsake not your mother's teaching. Let me do a little work ahead of time, because we're going to talk about something here that might cause some of you to feel uncomfortable We're going to speak about one side of the equation first, and I promise we're going to come and we're going to speak to those who may be in a different setting and situation of life. So on the one hand, what we see in Proverbs is very clear. Who's responsible here? Who who, who are tag teaming, so to speak, in the work of giving wisdom to this son? It's the dad and the mom. Now, I know we live in a world where there's a lot of unhealthiness when it comes to marriage and family. And we're going to speak to that on the other end here in just a moment. But let us not just throw out the blessing and the beauty of healthy families because we live in a world where there's tragedy and where there's trial. There are many healthy families in this church family, and I want to say that is awesome. Keep pursuing Jesus. Keep loving your spouse. Because healthy families promote a fertile environment for giving wisdom. It's the dad and the mom who are backing one another up. They're providing instruction. They're providing teaching. They're providing a demonstration of what walking with Jesus and walking wisely in this messed up world look like. Imperfect, yes. Fallen, yes. Nobody in here is perfect. There's not a perfect dad. There's not a perfect mom. I know I'm sure not. And yet what we find is, is that there is good work going on in healthy families. Healthy families promote a fertile environment for wisdom where mom and dad are working together. Where we're pulling in the same direction. Where we are intentional about being where we're supposed to be and doing what God's called us to do, to invest spiritual truth, biblical truth, into our kids. Where we're making time for family worship at home, and ever how chaotic and imperfect it may be, we're talking about the scriptures. Where you're spending time in the morning, maybe on the way to school, maybe at night before bed, where you're praying with your kids, where you're talking about the things of Jesus Where in appropriate ways, when your kids hear something going on at school or they see something and have a question, where you can make some time to to work with them and walk them through what the scriptures have to say about whatever that particular issue may be. Healthy homes promote a fertile environment for wisdom where dad and where mama are pursuing Jesus and they're growing They're being shaped and transformed. They love one another, and we ought to celebrate those homes. But what we find often in our day and age is that even in what appear to be healthy homes where we talk the game of Jesus and we talk the game of church, that we have become easily distracted from the main thing. Where we become easily distracted from what God has put us here to be as moms and dads. The goal for which we ought to primarily be aiming, and that is the goal of raising wise sons and daughters who fear the Lord in every way. There are some of you, I would assume, I know that there are many in our community who view parenthood because they've bought in to what the culture says that 
Parenthood means that I am friends with my kids. There may come a day and age when your kids are old enough when you consider them a friend. I hope that happens with my two boys. I see that with my dad. But there are many of us, us, I'm including myself in this, who our kids are at a certain age. God didn't call you to be friends with them. God didn't call you to be their buddy. And you're parenting and operating in a way, well, I can't rebuke them and I can't discipline them and I don't want to say anything negative to them because they may not like me for a season. God put you on this earth to have responsibility over your kids, to train your kids and to love your kids. I really like what Pastor John Kitchen has to say. No one left to himself ever arrives at wisdom. You and I see that. If the Holy Spirit wasn't working on us, if other Christians were not investing in us, if the Word wasn't having its work doing, done in our lives, you and I would not grow in wisdom. I think of all the people that have invested in my life through the years, and without them and without God's gift in the form of these people, I would not arrive at a growing wisdom on my own. And you wouldn't either. And guess what? Our kids will not either. Our kids will not If we're not being the parents that God's called us to be, God didn't call you here to be buddy-buddy with your kids and to never tell your kids no. He put you here to be a God-shaping tool and resource over and in their lives to have authority over them, to tell them no, to tell them what it is to, to treat others with respect and to listen And to see the goodness and the glory of God at work in their lives and in other lives. To learn what hard work is. To learn what discipline is. To learn what authority is, whether it's from you or from others. For those of you that's here here this morning and your parenting is all consumed with, I want my kid to be my best friend and to know that I'm buddy-buddy with them. I want to issue a pastoral loving word to you. Grow up. And I mean that in love. Grow up. Because if you don't grow up, we're going to raise a generation of people who do not fear the Lord, who are not following Christ, who do not know how to deal with hard things in life in a Christian way, who do not know and appreciate the authority that God has given us. We need loving and bold parents who will follow and pursue the ways of Jesus regardless of what others think and say about us. We live in a world full of distractions that are taking us away from the primary responsibility that we have as moms and dads. Several weeks ago I read this. I'm not exactly sure how long ago it was. But it provided a helpful kick in the pants to me. You know, the Lord has allowed different people, different conversations, different things I read from his word and other places to kind of steer my focus back to where it ought to be. As a dad who loves sports and as a dad who loves coaching, You know, it's very easy for us to get caught up in the distractions that are offered to us in this world. Sports distractions, some of you are in other extracurricular activities like theater or whatever the case may be. You you just fill in the blank. For for me and my family, if we're not careful, because these things can be really good things and they can teach a lot of good life lessons when they are taught appropriately and lived appropriately, but boy, they can quickly become idols, can they not? And I was reading something several weeks ago that just, again, reminded me, and the Lord took a two-by-four to my head years ago, and I'm thankful that he did, to wake me up to some things. And every once in a while, I just need a kick in the pants. And I didn't know when I had read that that it would be appropriate to share this with you, but, man, it's been on me this week. Listen to this. This is a conversation between a youth pastor, and so Phil, I need to probably have Philip come up here and read this so that you get mad at him instead of me, but I've taken some liberties to kind of rearrange the conversation so that it fits our context. So a family, 
maybe you who've got youth kids, maybe you've got older, younger kids, whatever the case may be. You come up to our youth pastor and you talk about how you want your child to be involved in church and to grow into the image of Christ. Very healthy start to the conversation. And so our youth pastor, y'all mind if I call him Philip? (laughs) That'd be all right. Philip, do you mind? So Philip says, yes, absolutely. We would love to partner with you in discipling your kids in what it means to love and follow Jesus. In fact, we meet every Sunday at church at 9 a.m. for care groups where we're going to be able to discuss the scriptures and how it applies to life. And then we have worship corporately with our church family at 1030. We also have other opportunities for intentional disciple making through the week. At five o'clock, we meet in small groups with our youth for discussion and disciple making. On Wednesdays at six, I teach the scriptures and we worship Jesus together. And for you who are the parents, we meet and the adults meet at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays for prayer groups and Bible teaching. And there's other opportunities for intentional disciple making to help you grow in the wisdom of Jesus through care groups and D groups throughout the week. The parent looks back at Philip and says, oh, wow, that's a lot. Let me see if we can fit that into our schedule. The next day, This family, the parents, have a conversation with their sports coach or their theater director or whatever it is you fill in the blank. And here's what the coach says. Hey, your kid shows remarkable talent. We would really like to come alongside and help you develop that. We meet every single day for two hours and they cannot be late to practice. Also, we're going to need you to invest thousands of dollars on practice, a personal coach, a personal trainer, and all of the equipment because the cost of making it is not cheap. Also, when we practice, it'll be practiced two hours every night of the week for nine months, and then we're going to play games this season on Saturday and Sunday. Your entire family is going to need to reorient your life around this effort. And the parent responds, that's wonderful. We will be there. We won't miss. What else do you need us to do? Now, if that's a swift kick in the backside to you like it is to me, it's because you and I need the reminder that when I stand before Jesus, he's not going to ask me what Timothy's three-point shooting percentage is. He's not going to ask me how many rings or trophies Nathan won with me coaching him on the basketball court or on a baseball field or on a flag football field. He's not going to ask me what their GPA is, as important as that is. He's not going to ask me how many books did they read if they're not reading the main book that they're supposed to be reading. Jesus is not going to ask me a lot of the questions that if you were to look at our lives, you would think that he's going to ask us because we put so much effort and energy into these things. He's going to ask us, did you tell your kids about me? Did you live in a disciplined way so that they knew that Jesus was the priority of your life? Did you live your life in such a way, in the ways that you spoke to others, in the ways that you talked about their coaches and their trainers that demonstrated the love of Jesus? Were you trying to live out your childish ambitions through your kids and therefore in a way creating some monsters? Or was growth in godliness the goal? Now, hear me again. I think all of these extracurricular activities and all of these pursuits have their place. I think that there can be good. We've seen good. We've seen God work through those areas. But friends, we can be so easily distracted so that we forget what God has put us here for. I mentioned earlier that healthy families promote a fertile environment for wisdom. There are others of you in here, and I know, not from experience, but because I have shared with you and talked with you and because you've called me. We've met in my office. We've we've met over lunch. We've we've talked on the phone. There, There are some of you in here this morning, you're saying, 
You, you can talk about healthy families all day. I am not in a healthy home. I'm not in a healthy marriage. I know what God's word says, that, that divorce is not good and, and that having parents pulling in opposite directions is difficult. I, I didn't want to be in that. I didn't, didn't realize what this is going to be. But here's where I am. Adam, what do, what do I do? I want to remind you this morning. Number one, God knows exactly where you are. Number two, he loves you. And number three, in his word and every day, we are seeing God do some incredible miracles and wonders through single parent homes. And when I say single parent homes, I'm not just talking about single moms and single dads the way the world would describe them. I'm also talking about spiritually single homes where only dad or only mama feel like they're pulling the entire sled spiritually for their kids and you're exhausted and it's frustrating and it is difficult. And maybe you're here this morning saying, what do I do? How do I be that dad? How do I become that mom? What am I to do when a father's instructions and a mother's teaching are in opposite positions and directions? God has a word for you this morning. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to a passage of Scripture that we looked at a few years ago, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And if it's hot in here, which I know many of you are because I'm sweating, we have had a compressor go out and we are working on getting a new unit. So just keep wiping the sweat. 2 Timothy 1, starting in verse 5. This is Paul's letter, second letter to Timothy, who's kind of his child in the faith, his son in the faith that he's mentored. He's been a spiritual dad to him. Timothy's now pastoring the church at Ephesus. Verse five, I am reminded of your sincere faith. The word sincere there means the real deal, genuine. That it's not just something that you talk about and something that you do once a week. This is sincere. This is life-shaping faith. I know about your sincere faith. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Hey, single mamas, mamas that feel like you're pulling the entire spiritual load for your family. Where's dad in this? Best we can tell from the book of Acts and from what Paul writes here to Timothy, best we can tell is that Timothy's dad was a Greek speaking, he was from a different place that best we can tell, he was not the spiritual leader in his home. We don't know where he is at this point when, when Paul's writing to Timothy. But there is something that's not healthy in that home. There is something that Timothy grew up in that, that's, that's not the most fertile ground for spiritual growth. And yet, look at how he turns out. Look at what God is allowing him to do in his kingdom. And this is the encouragement to you this morning. That even though you may feel isolated and that you're pulling along by yourself, you continue to pursue Jesus. You continue to love him. You continue to pour wisdom as best you can into your kids as the wisdom of Christ is poured into your life. And you never know what God will do through your sincere faith and devotion and dedication to the Lord and how your efforts, your surrender before him will be used in mighty and powerful ways. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm not going to ask you to turn there. It's a lengthier section of scripture. Many of you, and I've done some counseling with this passage. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is talking about marriage and divorce. And he's talking about the different situations in which we find ourselves today. And he comes to a certain situation where evidently there is a believing wife who fears the Lord, who is growing in Christ and her faith. And there's a husband who doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. Nothing. Doesn't care about the things of God. He's not a believer. Still lost in his sins. And Paul knows that that's, that creates a situation of tension and difficulty in the home. And he says to the believing wife, if your husband continues to, to desire to be married to you, 
You should stay married to him, for you never know what God may do and how he may sanctify your husband through your prayers and your life. I know it's not optimal. Paul knew it was not optimal. It wasn't the healthiest of environments for a marriage or for for raising kids. And yet, when we surrender to the Lord, it is amazing what he can do in us and through us in ways that we may not be able to see in this particular moment. For those of you that are struggling, hurting, who, as I said earlier, feel like you're pulling that spiritual sled all by yourself, Jesus is good, and Jesus loves you, and Jesus knows, and Jesus will bless in his way your efforts as you continue to surrender him, and you continue to pray, and you continue to grow and invest and lead your kids. There's a message here for all of us because there's people looking to us daily. Christ calls his entire church to be spiritual fathers and mothers to others who may come from an unhealthy home, who may not see the love of Christ. And yet when they're here or when you're coaching them on the ball field or when you see them at school, you're having an opportunity to love them and show them the ways of Jesus. As we go back to Proverbs to close this morning, I want you to look with me at verse 9, Proverbs 1, verse 9. So we see that... Dad's giving instruction, mama's teaching, and the child is supposed to live in accordance with that. And we've got some young people here in the room this morning. If you're a kid in the room this morning, I know all of our second graders and down are back in glory kids. How many third through sixth graders are in the room this morning? Would you raise your hand? Lift it high, be proud. Waverly, you better not stick your tongue out at me, right? Okay. All right, keep your hands up. How many youth do we have in the room this morning? Come on. Good. You know what your responsibility is on Mother's Day? It's to give your mama a Mother's Day gift, right? So, what does mama want for Mother's Day? Well, that is a lifelong question that I've been trying to figure out for years, right? You know, I do what? Say that? Work done, Work done around the house. Okay, there's one answer. There's a lot of different answers to the question, what does mom want for Mother's Day? Because every mom is a little bit different, right? And eventually you feel like you're running out of ideas. I don't know what your mama wants for Mother's Day today. But if she's a godly mother, I know what she wants over the course of the long haul. Now look with me at verse 9 of Proverbs 1. Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Forsake not your mother's teaching. Why? Because they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Now, what in the world does that mean? What he's referring to in that day and age when there was a sporting event or a competition, a contest, the victor, the winner, would have a garland, a wreath-like thing, put around their neck and they would wear it and everybody would know that they had put in the effort and the work that they had been disciplined the pendants for the neck were kind of in that same category it was a way of demonstrating and showing how attractive hard work is because it promotes success (laughs) it promotes blessing here he is saying That if you will listen to your godly moms and dads, even though they're not perfect, even though mama and daddy mess up sometimes, even though they act out of anger at times, if your mama and daddy love Jesus and are trying to grow and are trying to teach you the ways of Christ and what it means to live in an honorable way, if you obey them, you will find down the road that they are a great blessing to you. On the flip side, they're also a great blessing to mom and dad. The passage that Colson read for us this morning, I'll read, give it back to you. The father of the righteous greatly rejoices. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. What does the godly mama want for Mother's Day? 
She wants sons and daughters who grow up to fear the Lord and walk in his ways. That's what mama really wants today. Mama really wants, whether mama is 30 or whether mama is 60 or whether mama is 90, she wants to see sons and daughters and granddaughters and grandsons who have learned to die to self and follow Jesus who have learned to love others like Jesus loves, who have a heart motivation for the kingdom of God. Inevitably, we have encountered mamas and daddies who have their hearts broken because their children live outside the boundaries of Jesus' ways. And they're outside the kingdom And they're involved in all kinds of worldliness. And I talk with them quite frequently. They ache and they hurt because their child is not following Jesus. Friends, the best gift that you can give your mother today is to listen carefully to her godly wisdom and to pursue Jesus, to acknowledge your sins to see his great love for you demonstrated on that cross and to allow your life to be shaped and formed and fashioned by him and his word. Mama really just wants the gift of a wise son, a God-fearing daughter that loves Jesus and is making a difference for his kingdom. 